Welcome to Prevention Is Now. I'm Deb Bonner, preventionist and community advocate for Perry Center Against Sexual Assault in Springfield, Illinois. Sexual assault on college campuses is not a new topic. We have discussed previously on this program issues with Title IX and the prevalence of sexual violence on campus. And despite prevention efforts such as bystander intervention training and consent education, the statistics really haven't changed in decades. What is new are the findings from Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Kahn in their book Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus. The book has been named one of NPR's best books of 2020. The research, conducted over five years at Columbia University and Barnard College, takes a unique look at the sexuality of college students, who is having it, why, and perhaps most disturbingly, how sexual assault within this environment is inevitable to a certain degree. This unique look gives new insight into the issue with hopefully better tools for addressing and tackling campus sexual violence. However, this comes with a warning as well. The authors talked with over 150 students sharing their personal experiences. These stories can be triggering for some individuals and self-care should be practiced. These stories can be difficult to hear and if you need to take a break, please do so as you need to. So my guests today are the authors of Sexual Citizens. Jennifer Hirsch is a professor of sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Along with Dr. Claude Ann Mellons, she co-directed the Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, also known as SHIFT, a study supported by Columbia University that examines sexual health and sexual assault among Columbia and Barnard undergraduates. Dr. Hirsch has also been named one of New York City's 16 heroes in the fight against gender-based violence. Seamus Kahn is a professor in and a chair of the sociology department at Columbia University. He is the author of numerous books, including Privilege, the Making of an Adolescent Elite at St. Paul's School in 2011, and The Practice of Research in 2013 with Dana Fisher, and Approaches to Ethnography in 2017 with Colin Jeromach. In addition, his work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and CNN, just to name a few. And in 2018, he was awarded the Hans L. Zetterberg Prize for the Best Sociologist Under 40. So welcome to both of you. And Jennifer, I would like to start with you the roots for sexual citizen actually goes back to 2014 when you realize that during all of these discussions surrounding the issues of sexual violence on campus that were happening at the time, the focus really more was on punishing offenders with some discussion on supporting survivors, but really not a lot of attention was actually going to be focused on primary prevention efforts. So can you expand on how that led to sexual citizens? Sure, Deb. And um, I'm actually going to you're right that our focus is on prevention, and I'm going to open with a story to give listeners a sense of what it feels like to read sexual citizens. Austin was uh, a very engaging interview subject when we spoke with him. He was, um, he'd been at school for a couple of years, and he was a good boyfriend. He talked about how much he cared about his girlfriend and how much he wanted to show up for her in the relationship, including doing his part to make sure that she enjoyed their sexual relationship. And so it was surprising to him and to us when he described assaulting someone in in the interview. He didn't initially label it assault. He talked about a night early in freshman year when he'd been shuffled off to someone else's room so his roommate could be alone with his roommate's girlfriend. There was a young woman who was in bed in that room and when he walked in she said to him that she didn't want to do anything, which is kind of weird because like if you're in your own room in your own bed, why should you have to say that? And yet he didn't listen to her. He got in bed with her and started to touch her body. And at first, as we interviewed him, he described that as a weird experience. But then later in the interview, we asked him what a sexual assault was and he knew. He said it's any kind of unwanted sexual anything. And then his eyes welled up and he became pretty distraught. And, you know, we tell that story, first of all, to illustrate that the people who commit sexual assaults do harmful things, but the conversation has left out the fact that they may not necessarily be bad people. But also because most of the conversation, as you said, around campus sexual assault has been so focused on adjudication. And so if you think about that story with Austin, like, was there evidence, you know, like it would have been a very hard case to adjudicate. But our position is, how about we do more to prevent things like that from happening, Um, which was not where the conversation was in 2014 with sexual citizens. Seamus and I 
hope to change the national conversation around campus sexual assault to show people how sexual assault is designed into the campus experience, which sounds kind of grim. But then once you see how it's designed in, then you can have the next part of the conversation, which is to talk about what is required to design it out. So before we get too much into the findings, can you tell us a little bit about how the research was actually conducted for this book? So the book draws upon the ethnographic portion of the shift study, which Jennifer co-led with Claude and Mellon. So ethnographic study means we sort of did three different kinds of things. First, we talked to people. We interviewed 151 students about their everyday lives, their lives before college, their lives in college, and then their sexual experiences. So we interviewed them not just about their experiences with sexual assault, but also with sex in general. And part of our understanding there was that you can't understand sexual assault without understanding sex, because most assaults emerge out of sexual contact. In addition to those interviews, we wanted to see students talk in groups, sort of the collective discourse. So we ran focus groups with about another uh, 170, maybe 200 students. And so that allowed us to see how different kinds of students, students in general, students who were the first generation go to college, uh, minoritized students, queer students, different kinds of students talked about their sexual experiences. But what people say and what people do are not necessarily the same thing. And so in addition to looking at those stories that we heard in the interviews and the collective conversations that we heard in the focus groups, we embedded within campus life. And this really kind of is what makes the book a little bit different. Uh, Jennifer and I spent time in dining halls and on sports fields with students, watching them compete and hanging out with other students as they watched them compete or enjoying a meal together. In addition, we hired uh, four people who were deeply embedded in campus life. They were at fraternity parties, sorority events. They were at religious student organizations, on intramural sports teams. They spent time hanging out with students at night, making dinner or playing Catan until two in the morning. And this gave us a sense of just the everyday feel of what it is to be a college student. Put together this ethnographic portion of the study that Jennifer and I co-led together is the basis of sexual citizens. And that ethnographic study is also in conversation with the broader shift study, which also did a survey, a random population survey of 1,600 students, as well as a quantitative diary following students for 60 days, surveying them every single day. And so this book draws upon the research findings from that quantitative portion, and then our own qualitative portion of the research which is really kind of the most comprehensive study, a community study of sexual experiences we think that's been undertaken. And that sort of makes it a little bit different than a lot of the the studies out there. Now, I really feel like before we start talking about the specific experiences and stories from the book, uh, we have to address the idea of shame that surrounds sexuality. I mean, there's this bizarre dichotomy, at least I feel, in this country. On one hand, uh, it's, we're almost hypersexualized. There's graphic content in the media, on social media, and the jokes people tell. However, when it comes to sex in the real world, we don't talk about it much. And when we do, there can be a lot of judgment. However, when we talk more about this later in the program, people have sex for lots of different reasons and in lots of different ways. So how do we deal with this issue of shame and create a sense of open-mindedness that's really going to allow us to deal with the sexual violence issue? Well, our argument in Sexual Citizen is that we actually can't deal with sexual assault prevention effectively unless we acknowledge that we need to prepare young people because they're going to have sex at some point. And so the the denial of their right to eventually choose the kinds of sexual experiences that they want to have is a root cause of sexual assault. So think about young people and driving. And I speak as a, a mom whose two sons have recently learned to drive. So I can tell you that like it's not always a welcome transition when your kids are going to drive, but you don't say to them, not under my roof or, and you don't like let them grab the keys when they're drunk and hope it works out. Okay. No, you like acknowledge that this is part of a transition to adulthood. And there are all sorts of systems in place. Even if parents don't teach their children to drive, there are graduated driving 
uh, laws and road design and car design. And we have like we have built a world in which young people can do something which is potentially really dangerous, which is to move around the world in a two ton vehicle without hurting other people or themselves. And we have fundamentally failed to do that in relation to sex. And it doesn't mean that they don't have sex. It just means that they're really, really underprepared. And the, the parental abdication of instruction, uh, sort of values-based instruction around sex, essentially means that for a lot of kids, the only place they can learn about sex is through pornography. And so if you, if you want your children to, you can't, you can't guarantee that your children are going to absorb your values around sex, but they're certainly not going to get them through ESP. And so if parents want to shape their children's values, they have to be, be willing to have a conversation. And that conversation begins with the acknowledgement that almost everyone in America has sex before marriage. And again, as a parent, I know children do a lot of things that we would rather that they didn't do. I, you know, I've never been able to get my own children to floss, right? So like it, it, they, they are in control of their own bodies. It's our job as their parents to set them up for controlling their own bodies in a way that teaches them to take care of themselves and not hurt other people. One of the unique things about the book and your research is that you really take a look at sex as a whole. I mean, going back to what we were just talking about, and obviously we talk a lot about, or you talk a lot about sexual assault, but while some of the stories you share don't necessarily rise to the level of illegality, the behavior is certainly problematic. So how does that broader view of sex help us understand perpetration and ultimately prevention better? So most people are assaulted by someone they know, indeed someone that they've had some previous sexual contact with. And also most people are assaulted in contexts that are consensual until they're not. And this idea of consensual until they're not doesn't mean to suggest that there's sort of a gray zone between what is or isn't assault. It's a clear distinction between consensual and non-consensual sex particularly in contexts uh, that have affirmative consent as their rules. And affirmative consent just means that people have to clearly convey their consenting to sex. The absence of a no is not consent. But, you know, so many people told us stories where they were enjoying what was happening until they weren't. And so part of what we try to do in this book is understand those moments where things turn from being a consensual encounter to being a not a consensual encounter. So for example, Scott and Lucy is a really classic kind of story of assault. And by classic, I just mean what m many of us imagine. Lucy was a freshman. Scott was a senior. They met at a bar that, you know, let Lucy in because bars tend to let women in, even if they're underage and their fake IDs are really bad because they know that it means that guys will be there buying drinks. And she met Scott. She was excited to meet him. He invited her back to his fraternity. She was excited to go back with him. They made out a little bit along the way. He asked her to go up to her, his room. She wanted to go up to his room. They were making out. Again, she was excited about what was happening. You know, she lived a really sheltered life before this. And it seemed like her college plan of making out with boys and coming into her sexual own was coming together until he started to unbutton her pants and she said, no, don't. And he said, it's okay. Of course, it wasn't okay. He assaulted her. Uh, he raped her. And what we want to do is understand those moments, those distinctions between a moment where someone like Scott stops what he's doing in that moment and recognizes her no, and the evening has a different path versus that moment that he says to her, it's okay. And critical here is our concept of sexual citizenship. The idea behind sexual citizenship, which is, you know, the, you know, the book's title is inspired by this concept, is that we think communities have failed in helping young people develop a sense of sexual citizenship. What we mean by that is people have the right to say yes to the sex they want to have, as well as the right to say no, and that the people they're with have an obligation to recognize that they're equivalent human beings, meaning that both people have the same sexual rights. And in that Scott and Lucy story, the real failure was in Scott's 
recognition of Lucy's sexual citizenship. And so in, the, in looking at these variety of stories of times where people stop with what's happening versus uh, men like Scott continue to try and get what they want out of the encounter and assault people, um, we think the framework that we provide can help us see that with a little bit more clarity. Now, you talk about three different concepts in the book. There's sexual projects, sexual uh, geographies, and sexual citizenship. Can you guide us through these different ideas and how they may put someone at risk for either being assaulted or being a perpetrator? Sure. And actually, I'll return to the story of Scott and Lucy that Seamus just shared. So sexual geography looks at how space shapes both sexual interactions and produces vulnerability to sexual assault. So in that story, they were on the third floor of a building where Scott lived and was surrounded by his friends on a campus that Lucy was new to. And so for her, that sexual geography, where they were, made her very vulnerable. For him, he may not have understood his power in that moment. He may not have understood how hard it would feel to a freshman, a first year woman to insist when she said, no, don't. And he said, it's okay. How paralyzed she might have felt up in his bedroom on the third floor. But sexual geographies is also um, in some ways the most modifiable of those dimensions because the campus environment which gives better housing to more advanced students and puts most freshmen in shared spaces where they don't have privacy for sex and they don't have room to host parties. That is a housing system that funnels younger vulnerable students into environments that they don't control socially. So so the sexual geography, it's not just the backdrop for that story. It's actually almost a third player in producing that situation. And sexual projects ask the question, what is sex for? Which you might think like only a couple of college professors would ask that question because maybe everyone knows what sex is for, except it's not, it's certainly not for reproduction among the students with whom we spoke. And a lot of the sex they were having was not very pleasurable either. So sex can be to, to figure out who you are, which was frequently the case for, for queer students or just to get some experience. And in some, on some, in some instances, sex was also a realm of expressing care and intimacy with another person. But you can see that Scott's sexual project in that interaction was just to have sex. He, like, he was very clear about what he was trying to get out of that. And Lucy's sexual project was not to have sex, was to maybe make out right, to like get a little bit of experience. And sort of the, the where the rubber hits the road piece of this is sexual citizenship, because returning to what we said a minute ago, sexual citizenship is people's understanding of their own right to choose sexual experiences, but also their equivalent, their understanding of other people's equivalent rights. And so Scott certainly was, he when, when he, when Lucy said, no, don't, and he said, it's okay, he wasn't just assaulting her. He was erasing her. He was communicating that she was not an equivalent, self-determining person, that her no actually didn't matter. So he was unable to see and respect her sexual citizenship. And, you know, one take on that is that Scott's a terrible person, right? And And, you know, it's not a bad take. He certainly did a terrible thing, but that's not a take that gets us very far in terms of prevention. What we need to do is to be teaching people not to assault other people. And since when you say to them, don't assault other people, that doesn't really land in a productive way because people think, well, only people people who assault are terrible people. That's not me. I'm not at risk of assaulting. But if we can teach people to respect other people's sexual citizenship, that's a conversation where we also acknowledge that they have the right to choose sexual experience. And so it's a conversation that brings people in as opposed to putting people on the outside. And then Lucy's sexual citizenship, you know, she may very well have grown up in an environment that didn't support her um, 
feeling that she had the right to ever have sex, which certainly puts her at a disadvantage in terms of communicating her not wanting to have sex. So just 100%, we're not saying that it was in any way Lucy's fault what happened, but the social sort of undercultivation of young women's sexual citizenship is part of the problem here. Now, anybody who works in prevention knows that there is an intersectionality of of racism and oppression that goes hand in hand with sexual violence. And you have said that addressing racial inequality is, in fact, a form of prevention. So how do you see racism impacting sexual violence on college campuses? You know, Jennifer and I build upon decades of feminist work that have talked about sexual assault as being part of gender and power. But we add sort of two insights to this. And the insights really aren't our own, but they're helpful, I think, for making sense of why it is that we need to think about things like race and sexuality, ability, and class when addressing sexual assault. The first is that gender isn't the only type of power within sexual interactions. There are lots of other kinds of power that are important. And so gender simply isn't enough to make sense of what's happening. The second is that there have been developments in our understanding of gender. And a critical development is the development of intersectionality, that realizing that you can't just talk about gender as a thing in and of itself. It intersects with other forms of experience and other forms of social structures. Or put differently, the experience of black men is different than the experience of black women, just uh, so that we need to think about race as part of our gendered analysis. To get a little bit more practical, like to be kind of on the ground a little bit more, you know, every single black woman that we spoke to told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. Every single one. That is not just a problem of gender. That is a problem of anti-black racism. It's a problem of students at Columbia and Barnard not seeing black women as having legitimate authority over their own bodies or equivalent um, human autonomy, or equivalent sexual citizenship. And so the assaults that those women are experiencing are intimately tied to structural racism in the United States. We also heard a story from a young man named Carl, who was so concerned about false accusation because what it, of what it would mean for him as a black man in a criminal justice system in America that he went to extreme lengths to protect himself. He told us a story of a white woman who he met at a party, and normally he didn't like to hook up with white women. He assessed that she was too drunk. He waited hours before agreeing to have sex with her. And after they'd had sex, he recorded her saying that she'd had a good time. When he told us this, he also added that he'd done his research. He knew that New York was a one-party consent state, which meant that in the state of New York, a recording made without the other person's knowledge was still admissible in his defense. Now, think about that for a moment. Most of the men we talked to had a concern, a far outblown concern of false accusation. But a man like Carl, his concerns over false accusation were so extreme that he literally looked up the law in the state to hear about recordings to understand what would be admissible in his defense should he be falsely accused. You can't hear those stories, the stories of men like Carl or the, the simple fact that every single black woman experienced non-consensual sexualized touching without recognizing how race is deeply intertwined with sexual assault. And the reason it is, is because race is a system of power in American society. And if we understand sexual assault as being in part tied to power inequalities, then we can fully expect that major power inequalities like racism and racial power inequalities in the U.S. will be associated with assaults. The implication of that, the prevention implication, is, as you've said, that working towards equality is a sexual assault prevention strategy, that not all sexual assault prevention strategies are just about addressing sex. They're about creating spaces of equality and working to address the myriad power inequalities within American society. 
We're speaking with Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan, the authors of Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex power and assault on campus. And when we talk about prevention efforts, uh, the college experiences and really sex in general, it comes from a very heteronormative perspective. However, we know that people who are on the LGBTQIA plus experience uh, sexual violence at a significantly higher rate than the cisgendered population. Why is this population at higher risk and how are prevention efforts for LGBTQIA plus going to differ from those that are heterosexual? So there's, because sexual assault is not one thing, there's not one explanation for the higher rates that are found among LGBTQIA students. But I'll tell you one story that will give you some sense of some of the factors. So Adam had grown up in the Midwest and was not out to his family and was super excited to arrive in New York. He felt like, you know, as a young gay man, maybe he was going to be like a kid in a candy store. And in fact, he didn't really like being on Grindr and hooking up with guys who just would want to be with him, but then ghost him after sex. He, he actually was looking for a relationship. And so it, to him, it felt, it felt special and important to have a boyfriend. And as he, as he told us, there was just one problem, which was that his boyfriend, as he described it, was kind of forceful about sex. And then he went on to recount an instance in which his boyfriend came home drunk one night and, in Adam's words, basically raped me. So that story points out that there's not one correct sexual project that's going to protect people from being assaulted because that was an assault in the context of an intimate partner relationship. But you can also imagine that if Adam had grown up in a family and in a society where he had felt more supported for being a gay man, it might have been easier for him to leave his boyfriend who who was having sex in a way that he with him in a way that he clearly did not like. Another story that we tell in the book is of a young person who was outside the gender binary, who's, who was first assaulted actually before college even in a summer theater program. They talked about how that summer theater program in St. Paul was, as they described it, their first seeing of queerness. And it felt all of a sudden like it felt so affirming that there could be other people around like them. And yet in that summer theater program, they were assaulted by an older man they hadn't, they didn't have a lot of experience with alcohol. They got drunk and the man acted in a very predatory way. And so that is, there again, you can see how the social exclusion that queer youth have to navigate is part of what makes them vulnerable to sexual assault. If, if that student had grown up in a family that supported their gender identity or gone to a school that had a gay straight alliance and that protected students outside the binary, they might not have felt vulnerable in the way that they were vulnerable in that moment. So our our argument is that, again, equality is a sexual assault prevention strategy. If we want to really do something about reducing rates um, of sexual assault among queer students, we have to think about building a more inclusive social context. As I was doing my research for this interview, I heard you talk about that preventative efforts tend to be intellectual or cognitive in nature. Understanding consent, for example, I mean, it's you either have it or you don't. It's a it's a pretty simple intellectual concept. However, sex itself, especially in the heat of the moment, is emotional and social in nature. So can you explain that idea more and maybe touch on how we need to address this emotional component in our prevention efforts? Well, I think that there are a few things here. The the first is that in the broader shift study that we were a part of, in the quantitative portion of the study, and uh, this is actually a paper that was led by Jennifer's husband, John Centelli, so I feel like we want to give him some credit. One of the things that that paper found was that among women who'd had sex ed that was comprehensive and included practicing saying no to sex they didn't want to have those women were half as likely to be raped in college. Now, this is a profoundly big effect size. To put it in perspective, when we were first thinking about what effectiveness would look like for the COVID vaccine, what the CDC established as a a baseline for 
effectiveness for a vaccine was 50% effectiveness. So we kind of have a vaccine for sexual assault. We just refuse to use it. Now, what that sex ed is, is good sex ed, which means having people practice talking about sex. The idea that sex was a kind of cognitive, uh, uh, that, that saying no to sex is something that you just know how to do. Well, most of the things we don't just know how to do. We actually have to practice them. So to return to the driving metaphor, like we don't just give people a booklet about how to drive that says, here are all the techniques about driving. And then we just give them a license and think like, I hope that works out. Instead, what we want to do is put them behind a wheel and give them time to practice things. And so what this points to is that like effective prevention isn't just a series of verbal lessons that people master. Instead, it's also a set of um, practices that we instill in people where they practice the sets of things that they're supposed to do. And critically, we are not going to get there if we have abstinence only sex ed or sex ed that instills in young people silence and shame around sex. Most of the young people that we spoke to laughed when we asked them about their sex ed experiences. And they said, oh, you mean my sexual diseases course? Because what sex ed was, was a series of lessons about all the bad things that would happen to you if you had sex. You might get a sexually transmitted infection. You might have unwanted pregnancy. You know, these sorts of things are fear-based lessons that try to produce silence and shame around sex. What we have to ask ourselves then is, is it any wonder, given that silence and shame, that people are unable to express themselves in sexual encounters or to hear other people's expressions in sexual encounters? When Jennifer and I say that this world that we live in has sexual assault built into the very system, it's not actually that it's built just into college. It's built into the entire programming that we have to raise young people in the world. And the title of the book, Sexual Citizens, is a provocation. It says that actually becoming a fully formed citizen of this world means developing a sense of your own sexual right to self-determination. And if we as communities shut down conversations about that and refuse to actually raise issues of sex, intimacy, and values, the values of finding an intimate partner and being a good person within intimate relationships, then we're going to have exactly the outcomes that we see today. And so we've built this system. And what Sexual Citizens is is a book that outlines kind of way of understanding how that's happened, what its consequences are, and what we can do to build a different kind of world. As we mentioned earlier, this research was done on the Columbia and Barnard campuses. Now, these are both private institutions with pretty steep tuitions. Columbia is about 30% white from a diversity standpoint. Barnard is almost 50% white. It's probably also worth noting that Barnard is an all-female college. So would it be fair to say that many of the students you spoke with had a fair amount of privilege in their lives? And what does that mean for extrapolating your research findings to a broader picture? There certainly were things about the Columbia and Barnard campus context that are specific, not just, you know, the Ivy League nature of the institution, but also it's an urban setting. Most college students in America attend community college. So in fact, like more than half of students don't even attend residential college. So there are many things about the setting that are very particular. But what readers can take away from sexual citizens are the ideas, the ideas of sexual assault as being designed into campus. And obviously, depending on what the campus looks like, it, it's designed in, in different ways. So sexual geographies, sexual projects, and sexual citizenship, obviously, the sexual geographies on a rural state campus are going to look different than they do in urban Morningside Heights. But there is a sexual geography. So the ideas are sort of containers for questions that you could ask 
on any campus or actually in any institution about the management of sex and the production of um, vulnerability for sexual assault. So we have all this data now that is really challenging us to think about the issue of sexual violence on campus differently. So what is this telling us about what we need to do to create effective holistic prevention plans? You know, I think Jennifer and I have so much to say about this, both of us. The first thing I, I would notice that sexual assault is not a campus problem. It's an everybody problem. And that if we just think about this as a campus issue, we're not going to be able to address it. There are a bunch of reasons for that. The first is that one of the strongest prediction of being assaulted in high school, in, in college, excuse me, is being assaulted in high school. So I'll say that again. One of the strongest predictions of being assaulted in college is having been assaulted in high school. So we're coming at this too late, really, to, if we think about it as just addressing it on campus. But the second thing is that for many, many young people don't go to college and university. And those people who don't go to college and university, particularly women, the evidence is that they may be more at risk of sexual assault than people who do. And so some of the you know least privileged people may miss out if we just focus on this as a campus issue and focus our prevention efforts on uh, the campus. So what could we do really concretely? Well, there are things we can do on campus. I don't mean to absolve campuses, and there are things that we can do off campus. The first is we need to have comprehensive, age-appropriate sexuality education that begins in kindergarten. And for listeners, you know, they may think like, what do you mean kindergarten here? Well, absolutely in kindergarten. And in fact, young people are already getting sexual assault prevention messages. They just don't know that they're sexual assault prevention messages. So when you say to a kid, don't grab, use your words, that's a sexual assault prevention message. When you, when you say to a kid, you know, you can't just take something or touch somebody without their permission, you're conveying a lesson to them. And those kinds of lessons need to be built early in life and built upon in age-appropriate ways as young people develop. And one of the most important things that we can do as a community right now, everyone listening can do, is to advocate for age-appropriate sexuality education for all young people. And there's this sort of view that that is politically naive or can't really happen in our state. But let me just point out that there's a lot of evidence that it can happen, that there's bipartisan parental support for providing sex ed. And so we need to put pressure on our local representatives to say this is a necessary part of growing up and it's something that we need to provide. On a sort of state level and even a municipal level, putting pressure on different local organizations to do this is really important. I think also we need to think about building a bigger tent of prevention. So Jennifer and I think about DEI work, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, mental health work, and substance use work as all part of sexual assault prevention. But really, sexual assault prevention is an everyone job. And until we as communities understand prevention as something that we all have some responsibility for, I don't think we're really going to move the needle on this. And what that means is not that everyone needs to be teaching sex ed. It's that everyone needs to be conveying moral lessons to young people about respect for persons and fundamental equality, and that we need to connect those lessons to people's sexual and intimate lives. And I'm sure Jennifer has a lot more to say on this in terms of other interventions that we might think about as part of our prevention efforts. Well, I just have one very specific comment um, for listeners who are near the Prairie Center, which is that Illinois is not one of the states that requires that all young people get comprehensive K-12 sex education, but that there is a bill that's making its way through the Illinois legislature, the Responsible Education for Adolescents and Children, or the REACH Act, it's House Bill 1736. And if that bill is passed, it will mean that all young people in Illinois have access to that sexual assault prevention vaccine, which, by the way, is also has also been shown to be effective at protecting children in situations of child sexual abuse. Because when you teach kindergartners that they can't touch other people's bodies without permission and that nobody should touch their bodies with permission, 
if someone touches their body in a way that makes them uncomfortable, they'll find a grown up and get help. And so right now, there is a chance to actually ensure that all young people in Illinois have access to that. What's basically what happens now is that children in progressive school districts or children in fancy private schools might get that, but that everyone doesn't get it. And that's sort of, that's an inequality that is built into the educational system that there's an opportunity right now to address. We also have a lot that we could say about prevention on campus, but our fundamental message, as Seamus said, is that campus sexual assault is not a campus problem, it's an everyone problem. And that means that we need to expand out from just pressing campuses to do more and think about how we all need to do more. Jennifer and Seamus, I'd like to thank you both for being part of our program. Uh, So where can people find more information on your work, both collectively and individually? Well, we spend far too much time on Twitter, so they can nearly always find us there. But our book's website, uh, sexualcitizens.com, has um, a whole bunch of podcasts that we've done, including eventually, we hope, this one, so that if people don't want to buy the book, they can they can listen to it. Uh, there is also an audio book available, and then the book is available wherever books are sold. It's now out in paperback. We're on to the third paperback printing, which is pretty exciting. So it is literally selling like hotcakes, but uh, there are copies out there, and we would love to have people get them. The book is called Sexual Citizens, a Landmark Study of Sex, Power, and Assault on Campus. It is out now, and it is a powerful read. Jennifer and Seamus, the best of luck to you with your continuing research on this and on future projects. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much, Deb. This has been Prevention Is Now. I'm Deb Bonner, preventionist and community advocate for Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault. If you would like more information or have questions about this program, you may call our offices at 217 217- 744-2560 or send me an email at dbonner at prairiecasa.org. Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault supports children and adult survivors of sexual violence through counseling and legal and medical advocacy in 11 central Illinois counties. Prairie Center offers coaching boys into men for male high school and college athletes, bringing in the bystander training for college campuses and sexual harassment prevention training for businesses and organizations in our area. Our main office is located in Springfield, Illinois, with satellite offices in Jacksonville and Taylor Illinois, and you can find out more about our services at our website at prairiecasa.org. This program is supported by a grant from the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Points of view or opinions contained in this program are those of Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the official positions or policies of these grantors. Thank you for listening.